I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great and, as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The Barnum Museum has a unique treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to millions of ordinary people, as well as royalty and high society. These letters offer a unique glimpse into the life of P.T. Barnum as a husband, father, mentor, and entrepreneur. Join us as we travel back in time and learn about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum through his own words. If you enjoy this episode, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe to our podcast to help our rankings and support the Barnum Museum. And now, on with the show. Igniting Interest, Barnum's Views on the Loco Foco Party. As we've journeyed through Barnum's copybook, his letters have tantalized us with a wealth of storylines about his family, his museum, his tours in France, England, and Scotland, his young protege Charles Stratton, his connections to the world of showmen and attractions makers, plus topics such as his homesickness and health issues, his legal troubles, his business tactics, his opinions on religion and money-making, truth and dishonesty. The list goes on and on. His letters have revealed what was uppermost in his mind during those ten months of his life abroad, and undoubtedly provide us with richer insights into his character and a sharper lens on his activities, things that would not have been revealed in the course of ordinary correspondence written from home. Since Adrian was reading and sharing the letters a few at a time, gradually working through the 750 pages, we didn't have the benefit of hindsight to know which topics would unfold not just once, but through multiple letters, forming a storyline. Would some begin and end abruptly, or would we discover satisfactory answers to questions raised along the way? Because of the uncertainty, crafting the episodes often felt akin to weaving cloth, collecting the threads in order to weave them into stories, like patterns that emerge as the cloth is woven. Mind you, our cloth has not been a plain woven check that grows quickly with each pass of the shuttle in the loom. No, this was more complex, like a fancy weave. As we moved ahead, we were carrying many threads with us, often in the background, like the float yarns in a fancy brocade. Thus, some of our threads were dormant, out of sight, until it was their turn to be picked up again and caught into the weave. Naturally, this takes patience, but the iterative process is ultimately more rewarding, adding depth to our understanding of Barnum at this decisive period in his life. That said, not every letter in the copybook was woven into our cloth. As it turned out, the content of a few letters just didn't fit with any of the topics we'd been exploring along the way, and of course, that was not known until reaching the end of the copybook. Truth be told, those standalone letters prompted the occasional hopscotch, jumping over a letter here and there, in the hope that there might be other related correspondence just ahead that could fill out a storyline. But sometimes there just weren't any other letters or passages with which they connected. Luckily, this didn't happen often. But now, as we near the end, we'd like to share one of those singular letters with content unrelated to other storylines. In this particular letter from the spring of 1846, Barnum explains the ever-changing names of early American political parties. Perhaps that's a bit of history you've found as confusing as we have, and so you will appreciate the explanations Barnum offered to the editor of a Scottish newspaper. What makes these parties so hard to figure out is that often, within a short time period, opposing parties use the same or very similar names. This they did without regard as to how any ordinary person would remember their party's name from year to year. It's a head-scratcher to those of us looking back at early American politics. Who was called what, when? Clearly, no one had a marketing thinking cap on when it came to the party names. 
but we are far from alone in finding this confusing. Apparently, the British were also mystified back in the day, and we can be pretty sure annoyed by trying to keep track of the changes. In his letter of March 27, 1846, Barnum gives a kind of Cliff's Notes version of the various party name changes. He provided this as context for relating the incident that led to the Loco Foco Party's unusual appellation. Before we get to that, here is a little background on the Loco Focos, and if this topic sparks your interest, you may wish to look at a little book published in 1842, The History of the Loco Foco Party, or Equal Rights Party. It is available to read online in the Internet Archive, and the link is in the show notes. The incident Barnum describes in his letter begins on page 23 of that book. The Loco Foco Party began as one of several factions of the Democratic Party in the mid-1830s. They called themselves the Equal Rights Democracy. They were strongly opposed to the government's involvement in banking and to monopolies, among other issues. The group came to be called the Loco Foco Party due to the incident Barnum relates, but the Democratic Party's opposition, the Whigs, soon broadly applied the name Loco Foco to the entire Democratic Party with pejorative intent. The original Loco Foco group, that is, the Equal Rights Democracy faction, was actually not long-lived, because in 1840, during President Martin Van Buren's administration, they achieved one of their main goals, separating the government and banks. With that accomplished, the faction began to dissolve. For Barnum, this was not news of the moment, but it was recent history. What's interesting here is the way in which the equal rights democracy outmaneuvered the corrupt Democratic Party leaders of Tammany Hall in 1835. That's a story worth repeating, involving exactly the kind of practical, down-to-earth cleverness that appealed to Barnum. One can easily imagine how much he enjoyed telling the tale, and no doubt some of his British friends heard it from his lips. On March 27th, Barnum sat down to write to John Stuart Esquire from Egyptian Hall in London. Stuart was located at No. 20 Nidri Street in Edinburgh, Scotland's old town. He seems to have been an editor or publisher of one of that city's half-dozen newspapers. The main purpose of Barnum's letter was to apologize for not having taken care of overseas shipping tasks he had promised to help with, though he assured Stuart that he would attend to that business before the setting of another sun. Barnum's assessment of his own time management skills is revealed in his statements to Stuart. That is to say, You will discover that I am a miserable agent when I inform you that I have not yet even written to Liverpool to learn whether your boxes were received, much less have I yet taken steps for shipping them to America. The fact is, I can attend to my own legitimate business about as thoroughly as most men, but when that presses me, I have a sad habit of neglecting affairs in which I am more remotely interested. With that out of the way, he next apologized for not having had time to prepare an article fit for publication, though he gladly offered the facts regarding the origin of our Loco Foco party in America. He hoped that yourself or a friend can lick it into shape for publication. Perhaps Stuart and Barnum had met in January when Barnum was in Edinburgh, and mutually agreed that Barnum should submit an article. Stuart may have suggested something that would illuminate American life or politics to his Scottish readers. Since Barnum did not hide his own political persuasions in the article, I should note that at this time in his life, he was a staunch Jacksonian Democrat. A few years later, in the 1850s, he became increasingly dissatisfied with the Democrats' stance on a number of issues, such as the Kansas-Nebraska Act, that allowed settlers in the two new territories to decide on the issue of slavery by popular sovereignty. By 1860, with secession of the southern states threatening the nation, Barnum switched his allegiance to the Republican Party. Barnum prefaced his article by explaining to Stuart that what are termed Lucifer matches here in the UK are in America called Loco Foco matches. Loco Foco was actually the name of a patented brand of self-igniting cigars but soon came to refer to a new type of friction match that was safer than Lucifer's. Barnum then set the stage for his story. Some years since, I suppose about 1834, though my memory of dates is very treacherous, the Liberal or Democratic Party had been many years in power in the United States, and especially in the state of New York. They were in power by very great majorities, and, like all parties or individuals under heaven, 
When they suppose that they possess power which cannot be wrested from them, they begin to abuse this power and became in a great degree corrupt. He explained, That party had always been the Liberal Party, while the party opposed to them, whose legitimate name was the Federalist Party, but who changed their name, like many other rogues, nearly every year, was always found advocating the cause of the rich against the poor, the few against the many, the cause of especial rights and privileges, special bank charter and all monopolies, which would serve the interests of the wealthy or the would-be wealthy, to the detriment of the honest trader, farmer, or mechanic. The Federalist Party, he tells us, was one year known as the National Republicans, but the next year as the National Democrats, and then as the National Democratic Republicans. Then they went back to being the National Republicans, and finally became the Whigs, who were assimilated in some degree to the Tory party of this country. Barnum clarified the locus of the Democrats in the U.S., noting that, the great headquarters of the Democrats in New York, and indeed in America, was and is known as Tammany Hall in the city of New York. And it was from this hall, Tammany is an Indian name, that these leaders issued their edicts. In fact, Tammany was a name which charmed every lover of liberty. But the Democratic Party's principles began to erode in the 1830s. And according to Barnum, the Liberal Party also began to encourage monopolies and sadly neglected that defense of equal rights and privileges which had formed the very essence and groundwork of these principles. He explained the circumstances as follows. A certain set of old hunkers, as we termed them, had long, long been leaders of the Democratic Party, and had for many years met in caucus and made nominations for governor and other state officers for the state of New York, and these nominations were sent forth and always successfully supported by the entire party. In fact, General Jackson was first nominated by the Democratic leaders in New York for President of the United States, and so great was their influence at this time that the whole Democratic or Liberal Party of the Union would have voted to a man for any person whom this small junto would have nominated for the highest office in the gift of the people, President of the USA. With dissatisfaction building, at last the honest and intelligent portion of this party saw that the leaders were becoming degenerated that they always nominated themselves and their own personal friends, and that they had established a principle of favoritism, which would be ruinous to justice and totally destructive to that creed which advocates the greatest good of the greatest number. This is what led to the incident of October 29, 1835, as Barnum explained it. They therefore determined to oppose the farther dictation of these proud men, and a man named Job Haskell, a dealer in coals, etc., gave notice through the prince that on a certain night, when these leaders were to meet at Tammany Hall to nominate certain officers of state, that it was necessary for these Democrats, opposed to an abuse of power, etc., to also meet there, and by their votes put to shame all farther attempts at favoritism, etc. They did meet accordingly, and the old hunkers, finding themselves outvoted, declared the meeting adjourned till the following evening at seven o'clock. The radicals objected to this and attempted to reorganize the meeting, but the leaders ordered the gas to be turned off, and thus all were left in the dark and the meeting quietly dispersed. Realizing that the Democrats had a secret scheme to get the votes for their nominees, the equal rights democracy men came up with a plan to counter the efforts to obliterate their voices and votes. As Barnum tells the story, the object in adjourning the meeting was for the leaders to fill the hall on the following evening with friends of the old hunkers before the hour named. But the radicals were up to this dodge, and they quickly got word to their supporters. The next evening, the old hunkers of the Democratic Party found themselves once again outnumbered, and quite obviously so. The radicals insisted on making the nominations, but the old party leaders, seeing that defeat was certain again, ordered the gas to be turned off and in a moment, all were again involved in darkness. Here's where the story takes an unexpected turn. Instead of extinguished lights immediately terminating the meeting as the Democrats intended, the radicals were this time prepared against surprise, and in less than half a minute, 500 of them had pulled each a candle and a box of loco foco matches from his pocket, and 500 lighted candles were instantly held in triumph aloft by the hands of as many bold and unswerving friend to equal rights. The radicals then nominated their candidates, and the people ratified the nomination, for they were elected by glorious majorities. 
Needless to say, the radicals were instantly dubbed the Loco Foco Party, and for some months that name applied solely to the radicals. But the name soon came to refer to the whole party. As Barnum put it to Stewart, in less than a year, all differences in the Democratic Party were healed, but their common enemy, the Federalists, alias the Whigs, still continue to apply the term loco foco to the entire Democratic Party. Despite the intended insult, this was not an unwelcome name, Barnum remarked. In fact, I myself, in common with the whole party, rejoice in the name, and we apply it to ourselves. For now, having adopted a name which was first used by our opponents to stigmatize us, we are no longer tormented by our enemies stealing our name, and thus trying to mislead the people. Our party were originally the Whigs of America, but it having been so long used to distinguish the Federalists, we gave up that title as lost, and now the name Whig is understood in America by all Democrats to mean aristocrats and enemies of liberty. That Barnum knew his version of this history would appeal to Stuart's subscribers is suggested as he concluded his letter. He offered his story to Stuart with the final comment. There, my dear sir, from this hasty sketch, you may perhaps find sufficient to make out such an article as you desire, and I can only say that I am very much rejoiced to observe the rapid progress of education and liberal principles in Scotland, and indeed also in England, though the progress is not so rapid, and that I shall be but too happy at all times to hear from you. We hope you're enjoying the episode. If you want to support us, consider subscribing to our podcast and leaving us a review. It really helps us out. Now, let's dive into the next segment. I shall be punctually at Spillman's. Barnum returned to England in the summer of 1846 after a few weeks visit home. For reasons we will never know, there is a considerable gap between the time of his return and the dates of the last letters in his copybook. But knowing as we do that Barnum was a prolific correspondent, that gap surely was not due to a lack of letter writing, even though the copybook contains nothing from June or July, nor most of August. He may have started a new copybook upon his return, and if so, it no longer exists as far as we know, or he simply didn't use a copybook then. Perhaps he thought to write his late August letters in the old copybook just to use up the few remaining blank pages. So, in our copybook, there are just two letters that actually date from Barnum's return to England, and both were composed on August 20th, 1846. Barnum was in Gosport at that time, an area of Portsmouth on the southern coast of England close to the Isle of Wight, a popular holiday destination. Portsmouth is about 75 miles southwest of London and serves as a port for the various ferries that cross the English Channel. Perhaps August was a good time to be away from London, and Barnum had decided to book venues for General Tom Thumb's performances in towns near the coast. The change of scene and the sea air would surely have been a welcome break from the urban environment, and one would hope being on the coast included time for well-deserved R&R for the eight-year-old boy. His schedule of levees and nightly theater performances in London had been grueling, to say the least, though he seems to have tolerated the demands upon him remarkably well. Having only the letters Barnum wrote from Gosport and none from other towns, we cannot immediately say where else Charles performed, though researching period newspapers from that area of England would tell us what other towns he visited. But we do know that while he was in Portsmouth, he needed a new supply of souvenir booklets to sell, we learned from the early January letters that Barnum had approved an updated version of the booklet while he was in Scotland, and then wrote to his friend Thomas Brittell, a printer located in Haymarket, London. Barnum sent him a corrected and amended copy of the booklet, and noted that Charles's father was adamant that Barnum not be referenced as the boy's guardian. The senior Stratton had boldly declared, By God, it shall be took out, or my boy shall never sell a damned book. Barnum also sent Brittell a new cut, that is a woodcut printing block, so that he could add another illustration to the booklet. He was sending this cut, he told Brittell, by way of his advertiser, Mr. Sheffield, who was making a trip to London. He noted that, We want three more of them, so I wish you to get three stereotypes so as to send them by Sheffield on Friday, if possible. On what seems like short notice, Barnum requested, if possible, to have 1,000 of the booklets sent, 
Sheffield would pick them up on Thursday night or Friday, a turnaround of three days at most. Undoubtedly, several thousand booklets had been sold between January and August, so Brattell must have been accustomed to getting regular orders from Barnum. Barnum's August 20th letter simply stated, Please send 1,000 books to General Tom Thumb at the Fountain Hotel, Portsmouth. That hotel, by the way, was already historic at the time Barnum and the Strattons stayed there. It began as an inn in the 1760s and became a hotel a few years later. During World War II, it was badly damaged and then repaired, but the 200-year-old structure was eventually torn down in 1971. Barnum was clearly writing in haste when he contacted Brittell, explaining that although he had been in London, he had not had time to call on him because his trip was so brief. But he added, I expect to be in London the whole of next Sunday, and will drop in and say how do. Barnum respected and appreciated the kindness and hospitality Mr. and Mrs. Brittell had shown him. They were older than himself, and he and his wife Charity had developed a close friendship with the couple during their time in London. Brittell was not only a printer and publisher, but also Barnum's business associate in various other capacities. But whether Brittell went along with a very unusual proposition Barnum made in his August 20th letter is a matter of speculation. Barnum enclosed a copy of a letter, verbatim, as he said, that he had received from a lawyer of my acquaintance in America, and told Brittell, If you think it worth pursuing, you can make several thousand pounds by joining me in the matter, provided we succeed. The copied letter, dated June 29, 1846, had come from a lawyer in Bridgeport, Connecticut, a man named Mark Moore. In it, he described a strange story, which prefaced Moore's statement of the airship to the above 150,000 pounds. The story began decades before, with the discovery of a Mr. Charles Ferguson, an American, who was found dead near the Tower of London, and 150,000 pounds in banknotes was discovered sewed in between his ragged and filthy clothes, and a bundle of manuscripts in his own handwriting was found in his pockets up to the year 1808, and in his wretched hovel a valuable library was found. The deceased man was 94 years old. His only son, Charles Ferguson, had died in an accident in Stamford, Connecticut, when a barn fell. The son's widow and daughter were living in Stratford, Connecticut at the time of the accident, but the widow left her daughter there and moved to Middletown, Connecticut. The reason was not stated. The daughter, Nancy Ferguson, eventually married and had several children, and in 1843 she died at age 72. Reviewing additional facts, as stated in Barnum's copy of the letter, reveals a foolish error in identifying the man who died in London. The deceased was Henry Ferguson, not Charles. Henry was the father of Charles. Henry was a stonecutter who had worked in Middletown, Connecticut, but he had left America after his wife died. According to lawyer Moore, William Dart had held the power of attorney to collect the money for some 20 years, and had been in London on that business many years before. His relationship to the Fergusons was not explained, but he believed that the money, 150,000 pounds, found in Charles Ferguson's clothing, had been left in the custody of the Court of Chancery, and at 3% interest from the time it was deposited, this would now, 28 years later, amount to about $2 million. If Moore and Barnum between them could pick up the trail and pursue this with papers that he, Dart, had left in London with the American consul, Mr. Aspinwall, he would give them 10% of the amount collected. The information Barnum received seems to have lacked some key facts, and perhaps was a scam. A review of contemporary historical records shows that Henry Ferguson's date of death was October 17, 1808, according to the New York Evening Post. The New York Weekly Museum's October 29, 1808 issue published a death notice for Henry Ferguson, and also stated that he was a native of America who died in London age 94. He was a beggar and was found dead near the tower with 15,000 pounds in his clothing, had a valuable library. Interestingly, Barnum's letter, or copy of Moore's letter, has another zero in that sum, which certainly makes a big difference. Records of Rhode Island vital extracts confirm that the amount of 15,000 pounds was found in Ferguson's clothes, and notes that even more remarkable was the presence of a manuscript history of arts and sciences on his person. Ferguson was described as a miser, 
though his wretched abode was discovered to contain a fine library of books. The curious circumstances of Ferguson's death clearly made the news at the time, but lawyer Moore did not have it straight. It seems somewhat uncharacteristic of Barnum to pursue something of this sort, which was clearly outside of his interests and would be done for the sake of money alone. At the very least, he must have realized he could not take this on single-handedly in London. Taking Moore's information at face value wasn't wise. Granted, Barnum did not have quick ways as we do today to verify what was reported to him as factual, but the figure of £150,000 seems implausible for that time and should have raised an eyebrow, or both. Since Brattell was older than Barnum, he may have recalled the story, which was undoubtedly a sensation in London and the subject of various articles. Barnum was born in 1810, two years after Ferguson's death. Was Barnum considering lawyer Moore's proposition primarily because of its potential benefit to his friend Brattell, or was he caught up by the challenge and the lure of money? It's hard to say what he had in mind. Concluding his letter to Brattell, Barnum wrote, There, friend Brattell, you have the whole matter in detail. Now, the question is, is the case one in which there is any chance of success? Are there not legal gents in London who are au fait at this kind of business, and who would take hold of it on shares? Please think of it and let me know your opinion. In the meantime, if you think best to consult a 6-8 lawyer in the matter before I see you Sunday, do so. Barnum's next letter was to his friend and business associate, Phil, his nickname for Mr. R. Fillingham Jr., an American living in London. Fillingham was involved in the entertainment world and seems to have known all the various showmen, menagerie men, lion tamers, and circus performers, both American and European. As Barnum said in a previous letter to Fillingham, you are the only great and true representative of the Yankee showman's interests in London, or in fact, in England. His network was such that he could make connections for Barnum and at times acted as his agent. Barnum told Fillingham, as he had Brittell, that he planned to be in London all day next Sunday. This meant he would be able to get to Spillman's that evening and would meet Fillingham there. According to Barnum, Spillman's was considered Yankee headquarters in the area of London called The Strand and presumably it was a social gathering place like a club or tavern. In the 19th century, the Strand was a center for theater and a type of entertainment called music hall. Thus, the many taverns, coffee houses, and dining clubs in the Strand catered to people in that business. Barnum explained his absence at Spillman's on the previous Sunday, telling Fillingham, I could not possibly get to Spillman's earlier Sunday night, as I did not arrive till 6, and that damned old favor kept me till 10. I shall be punctually at Spillman's next Sunday night at 8. This would be a good opportunity for him to network. The fact that Barnum was meeting people at Spillman's provides a clue about a new venture he had engaged in, suggesting how it might have come about. He confided to Fillingham, The animal business seems to move slowly, but I think it will be stunning when it is ready, provided the devils who are laying claim to it will give up their claims, which they probably will this week. If so, it will come out next Monday. I hope that you can see it Sunday in the day or evening. Stuart and Starr can tell you whether it is possible. What was the animal business he referred to? And who was laying claim to it? Had an arrangement or agreement between showmen gone sour? We certainly wish there were more letters in the copybook so we could answer these questions. Barnum seems to have been unable to resist pursuing new ventures, which of course meant taking more risks. Some things worked out and some didn't. On a practical matter, Barnum's instructions to Fillingham suggest he was preparing for General Tom Thumb's entourage to wrap up their tour and return to America. He mentions shipping a number of items back to New York, care of the American Museum, and asked his friend to send the bill of lading to the museum manager. But this was more than a shipment of new novelties, as it also included General Tom Thumb's Little Carriage and the Pony Phaeton. They were to be crated, and Barnum asked Fillingham to keep the cost of their freight separate. Perhaps these were gifts from Queen Victoria to Charles, and Barnum thus expected Father Stratton to pay for shipping them home. From a historical perspective, it seems a bit curious that the carriages were being sent in August of 1846, because Barnum and the Strattons did not return to America for several more months in the early winter of 1847. The miniature coach with its ponies, driver, and footman had evolved into the general's brand, 
and people would expect to see them. Fortunately, they would not be disappointed. Ads tell us that the general would be appearing in a new carriage, promoted as an enticement. So it makes sense that the older carriages were being shipped to New York, where they would surely be used as attractions displayed in the American Museum. We know that naturalist Monsieur Guillaudeau had been tasked with preparing a pony hide Barnum sent from Scotland, modeling it to appear as if it was in motion. It is fitting that the last two letters in the copybook were written to individuals whom Barnum specifically acknowledged in his autobiography, remembering them fondly for their attentions and kind assistance. Fillingham and Brittell were included among the people to whom Barnum stated he was indebted for special courtesies while I was abroad. Another of Barnum's copybook correspondents, Mr. John Nemo, is also on that brief list. Barnum counted Mr. Nemo and his wife among his dear friends in Paris. Thinking back 25 years to the early period of his career, Barnum wrote in the 1869 edition of Struggles and Triumphs, or Forty Years' Recollections, In London, two gentlemen especially merit my warm acknowledgments for many valuable favors. I refer to the late Thomas Brittell, publisher Haymarket, and Mr. R. Fillingham, Jr., Fenchurch Street. It is good to know that Barnum had not forgotten the people who had helped him climb the rungs on his ladder to success, and there's a great sense of satisfaction in realizing that the copybook letters have enabled us to become acquainted with people whom Barnum chose to honor in his autobiography, recalling their helpfulness during a tough and challenging period in his life. In retrospect, of course, we see his great successes, but at the time it was largely about trial and error and risk-taking, coupled with very hard work. To be sure, there were rewards and triumphs, successes that would define Barnum as inimitable and shape a larger-than-life future for himself and General Tom Thumb. Thank you for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. Support for this episode is provided by the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities. The podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum and based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pinna, and narration is by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director, and John Swing is our COO. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and visit our YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Connect with us on social media and let us know what you think. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures with P.T. Barnum.